Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for a discussion with a group of amazing and distinguished women leaders in our city and county of San Francisco. My name is Carol Eisen. I am the Human Resources Director for the City and County of San Francisco. And on behalf of the Department of Human Resources, we would like to welcome you to our panel discussion of, on women at work. Women make up nearly half of our city workforce and are an integral part to what we do every single day. We hold positions in every field in city government from healthcare to maintenance, to analysts, to custodians, to police officers and firefighters. Women are integral and irreplaceable part of the fabric that keeps San Francisco running safe and healthy day in and day out. Over the years, San Francisco has implemented a number of policies that are intended to support women in, at work. Our equal pay ordinance, family friendly ordinance, lactation policies, many more. These have been groundbreaking and they have been replicated across the country. Today, we will be talking with some of the women that have helped move these policies forward and our leaders in their fields in their own right. We're going to ask each panelist to share a bit about their journey to leadership and to answer questions about their experience in city government and the projects that they are working on now. This is live streamed on SFGov TV. Uh, we'll also be sharing a recording of this panel session with all employees and uh, we will share the resources as well. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, you can look forward to more of these forums um, that we're going to roll out as part of our new, newly reconstituted DHR. So let's start with some self introductions uh, from our panelists, uh, starting with city administrator, Carmen Chu. Uh, uh, administrator Chu is uh, the executive leader within the city in her own right. She, many of you know her, she was a member of the board of supervisors. Uh, she was then served as our elector assessor recorder and most recently in January was appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the Board of Supervisors to be our city administrator, uh, a key uh, executive position in the city that keeps a myriad of day-to-day -day government functions um, going, cutting edge and advancing. Um, so Dr. Uh, uh, so city administrator Chu, why don't we start with you and then we'll move on to the other panelists. Sure. I, I'll. I will just uh, keep my comments uh, short in the introduction, but I just want to take a moment to congratulate actually, uh, Carol, you for your recent confirmation as well. And I think to also Kimberly and Dr. Philip, because I think the four of us share something in common, which is that we're generally in our role pretty recently. So we're, yeah. we're in a, not that we've been, we're unfamiliar to San Francisco, but um, definitely in our new roles in, a, in the most recent sense. Um, but just by way of background, um, I serve as San Francisco City Administrator now and have held uh, different positions across the city, um, have the honor of actually having served in all branches of, of government, the executive branch of government, the legislative branch of government, and then also uh, now as city administrator and previously as assessor, having run organizations as well. And so I think this uh, offers a unique perspective. And the, the thing that I want you to know most about who I am is um, I think really just connected to my upbringing and uh, having grown up in a, a family that was an immigrant family, um, a family that didn't have very much resources. I never forget that at the end in mind, when we're talking about public service, no matter how hard things get, it's ultimately about how do you serve the public? How do you create opportunities for people in, in our city? Um, and in particular for those who have the least resources and least ability to be successful without a helping hand. And so I just wanna take a moment to thank all of the city workers who have joined us today. Uh, thank you for all that you've done so far in our COVID response and what you continue to do to help serve our city. So thank you. Thank you, City Administrator Chu. Uh, let's move on to Dr. Susan Phillip. Uh, Dr. Philip has had a distinguished career within the city and county government. Uh, she was the director of the Department of Public Health's uh, Division of Disease Prevention and Control, and most recently was tapped to uh, step up into the uh, health officer 
position for the city when her predecessor uh, was promoted to the same job uh, for the entire state of California. Uh, a very big and essential job um, as we are still living in a pandemic and attempting to recover from it. So Dr. Phillip, uh, maybe you can introduce yourself for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be here with this, with this panel. And um, I, I will echo, uh, echo, echo my thanks to all the city workers who are watching and who make what we have done over the past year possible to really protect everyone in San Francisco and try and maintain, um, maintain, our, maintain our equity and, and try to move forward the best we can. And we're doing so well as a city, as people know, comparatively because of all the efforts of people here. So um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here this afternoon. And yes, I have worked for uh, the city and county in the Department of Public Health since I finished my training um, in infectious diseases 16 years ago. And um, I have learned, uh, learned so much and had the benefit of uh, being able to talk to and, and learn from some, some great people in the city. So I am, um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation and to, to learning more about these amazing uh, leaders um, that uh, I am really happy to be working alongside now. Thank you, Dr. Phillip. Uh, Director Kimberly Ellis, is our newest city employee, and we're very fortunate to have her. Uh, Director Ellis has uh, spent the better part of her career training women uh, for leadership positions and to run for local elected office. Uh, Dr. Ellis, please let us know something about yourself. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you to you, uh, our, our new fearless leader, Director of Human Resources, uh, Carol, for the opportunity to join you all. Uh, I've known Carmen uh, for a really long time and have been a fan of hers for a really long time and cheering her on the sidelines. Uh, and to you, Dr. Phillips, it's an honor to uh, to share the stage with you, with you ladies. Um, to uh, what Carol shared uh, just a few moments ago, I've spent the better part of my career really um, helping to educate inspire and empower women to um, take up the mantle of running for office and taking seats at decision-making tables where our lives and our livelihoods are being decided every day. Uh, I believe deeply that um, when we have more women uh, seated at those decision-making tables, what we get on the other side is more fairness, more equity, and more justice for the entire community. And so, uh, I've spent the better part uh, helping uh, women leaders who currently uh, serve in, in leadership roles, including our illustrious mayor of San Francisco, London Breed, uh, the mayor across the pond, uh, uh, Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff, our Lieutenant Governor, uh, first female uh, to serve in that role, Eleni Kunalakis, and uh, first black woman uh, ever to serve in the constitutional office, San Francisco's own Malia Cohen. And so um, my uh, sort of um, uh, commitment is to do everything I can to get uh, uh, more women uh, in positions of leadership uh, to Dr. Phillips' point, um, it is because of the efforts of uh, San Francisco and the workers here uh, that have helped position San Francisco uh, so well today, but I would also add that it is also because of the fierce, unapologetic leadership of women like Lyndon Breed, uh, who set the tone, the tenor, and the direction for how uh, we should move about uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the time of COVID and um, we've been reaping the benefits uh, ever since. And so again, thank you for the opportunity to join you all and look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Director Ellis. Uh, let's start with Dr. Phillip. Uh, Dr. Phillip, you uh, told us that after you finished your training in infectious diseases, you chose immediately a career in public service and that this is working in the Department of Public Health is what you've been doing since uh, your training. So can you talk with us a little bit about how you decided on a career in public service and what has been your journey since making that decision? Uh, well, I, I will say that um, just as uh, Administrator Chu uh, mentioned, I also am from a, a family of immigrants and, and an idea of service and um, 
of using opportunities to be to be useful to others and particularly thinking again has been mentioned here by our panel about making sure that everyone has an opportunity to in my case to be healthy to uh, to be able to 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 grow up with uh, with opportunities is really uh, ingrained at a, at a young age is, is just the thing that one does and um, I think that uh, in addition you know my interests in uh, infectious diseases in microbes in um, public health all of that sort of comes together to me with the issues of, of equity and, and justice, health justice, and um, and, and thinking about um, how how to be how to be a service in doing that. So yes, when I when I finished um, fellowship, it seemed to me that the most interesting and relevant work to people's um, daily lives and to to overall for the for the city um, to use my talents in that way would be would be working for the city and working for the Department of Public Health. And um, it has never been, there's never been a boring day since then. So I, I think I chose well. Uh, it's been a little bit too exciting on some days, but and then we could use a little bit more boredom, but um, it's been very personally rewarding to work for the city. And, um, and hopefully I've, I've uh, done my best and tried to serve uh, the residents of San Francisco uh, well in the position. Uh, thank you, Dr. Phillip. I think we can all agree that uh, none of us have ever been bored on the job. Uh, and if anything, a little more boredom, as you say, might come in handy sometimes. But uh, let's uh, talk with you, Director Ellis, uh, having spent a career uh, promoting women to run for office. Now you are uh, working for the city directly, uh, working in a department that has long promoted the interests of women, employees, residents, um, and generally in the world at large. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you made that decision to make the transition into public service? Yeah, well, I will say that um, the first time I, I, I realized that I wanted to um, dedicate my, my, my life's work to public service was in fact in third grade. Um, and um, it was after having to do a report on my favorite political figure. And that is how I stumbled upon the incredible trailblazing Shirley Chisholm. And after learning about Shirley's life and, and life's work, and more importantly, um, her dedication to women, to children, to families, to poor people. Um, I decided that you know when I when I grew up, I wanted to be just like Shirley. And so, um, although you know over the course of of my career, it certainly has been a circuitous sort of route uh, to get here. Uh, from my very first job at eighteen at McDonald's. Uh, to working in private industry, to working for state government, uh, to the nonprofit self sector, to um, self-employment through uh, a private consultancy, to now local government. Uh, I think that uh, what I bring is a wealth of experience of different um, systems. And so the ability to bring those experiences of best practices to now serve in a role um, where we get to, um, you know, make decisions about the distribution of resources in a way that really does benefit and uplift as many parts of our community as possible, um, including and especially women and girls. And so um, it's an incredible honor uh, to, to now be able to, to serve directly um, through public service. And I think that um, this is um, an incredible opportunity now with a woman uh, it, for the very first time, woman of color, black and South, uh, South Asian um, in the executive suite in the White House. Um, I think that has sort of uh, been an affirmation for many of us that the time is now to really move forward in bold and audacious ways to center the experiences, the lives, the perspectives of women and girls to really help create a, a community, a San Francisco um, that we know is possible. And of course, if it were just a few years ago, she probably would have been on the, this panel with us yeah. as another city employee. Let's uh, pivot to city, administ city Administrator Chu. You've been working for the city and in public service for some time now. Have you seen the field change for women at work and how so? 
And do you have any predictions about what we can expect over the next five to 10 years? Yeah. <laughs> what Good a question, question Carol. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you just by even seeing the folks who are on this uh, call today, I think there's we have seen forward progress in terms of women in leadership position. I mean, certainly having Mayor Breed be elected into the highest um, uh, role in the city, I think is, is um, proof positive of that in general. But I do think that there is a, a lot more work to, to be um, done. I, I think one thing that I would like to say is that one of the things that I hope we will be able to do, the folks who are on this panel um, and others is that we help to bring people along the way and help to develop leadership and capabilities amongst our, our employees and in particular, particular women, women emerging leaders. Um, I think this is incredibly important because I think about my trajectory into the role that, that I am in, in now. If you asked me uh, a while ago whether I ever thought that I would ever run for office, if you ever, if you ever asked me if I thought that I would be the city administrator for the city and county of San Francisco, I'd probably say no. My natural, my nature is that I'm generally an introvert. If you ask my mother, she would say, when you were a child, you were so scared to talk to any of the customers. You always hid behind me when, when we were at the restaurant and so on. And so I think the thing is that we all take on additional challenges as we go through our careers. And it would be a lie to say that, that I didn't have doubts about whether I was able to do my job as I have had to push myself through the different years, right? And through the different positions, first as someone who is behind the scenes to someone who had to put themselves out there, raise money, run for office, and then so on and so forth. But at every single juncture, I think that that self-reflection um, was actually fuel for me to keep on pushing and to know that I was enough, right? And, and I think that this is something that's important is that there's, there's often sort of this feeling about what leadership looks like and the typical characteristics of, of the personality that is needed to be a leader or to take a leadership role. And I wanna dispel that because I think if you ask anybody again, they probably wouldn't have said a personality like mine's would have been in this role, right? But it just means that you can grow. We all can grow and be effective at our jobs but we need mentors and we need people to give us opportunities and for us to seek those opportunities too. So I just hope that through this panel, um, folks are also able to see that, that we all are growing, that we all have a, a growth process in order to be kind of where we are. So the, I guess the hope in the five year period of time is that we'll be able to do more of that and foster more leadership in the city. Thank you for the, the thoughtful answer. I will add that uh, when I first started um, working with city employees in the 80s and most rooms that I found myself in, I was the youngest and often the only woman in the room. And that's changed quite dramatically in the past 30 years. And it's heartening to see all of you here today in the positions that you're in. Uh, let's uh, ask Dr. Philip now to speak with us about uh, leadership style how you approach this, what this means um, in the unique position that you find yourself in right now in really being our leader, helping us uh, prevent disease, keep ourselves safe and move us towards reopening the city government. Thank you. I, I think that it really, um, it really is clear that there is not one person determining uh, how everyone is going to behave and respond, and particularly so in, in this position, it's not only within the city that we're you know, giving our health orders and our directives and our, our guidelines, but we're also trying to engage all sectors and individual people, communities, um, businesses. And so having a, having a, a approach that's engaging, I am also an introvert. <laughs> and, um, and so, yay, introverts. <laughs> But it, it, it really is um, believing in, in the work that we're doing together and then trying to um, find ways to engage in, in people's um, interest in, in, in having the city succeed, interest in keeping their neighbors safe, appealing to people's um, uh, better, better selves and encouraging them and, and pointing out where we're, where we're doing well. So I, I find um, that for me, it wouldn't work to, to have a, a top-down dictatorial approach to leadership, either in my role across the city or 
um, within uh, within the teams that I work with most closely, and that I um, we we get the best ideas and the best progress made when um, when I'm open when I'm more open to listening to what people have to say and trying to incorporate ideas that um, I may not have had otherwise. And I think, of course, like everything, it's it's always balanced with um, as I moved um, through my career in the city and then just have gotten older, I also have a, a, a pretty good confidence in myself and my ability to um, understand and incorporate and synthesize information. So it's a little paradoxical, but it's both being able to be open and listening, but also having um, a sense of confidence that I will be able to uh, do do the job that I've been asked to do and will get the right inputs to try to make the decisions as best I can. But it it is very, very tricky. And I think um, the pandemic has really shown how challenging it is to try and, and navigate some of the decisions. Well, um, I'd like to, uh, before we run out of time, eventually pivot back to this notion of introverts. It's interesting to me that we have at least two self-proclaimed ones on this panel. I never would have guessed. Um, I myself am not one, <laughs> but I have always experienced introverts as being the best listeners. So I'm sure you bring great attributes to the job, both of you in that way. But uh, before we get too far uh, down that path, I want to ask uh, Director Ellis a question about something that interests me greatly. Um, in the last few years, we have seen an increase in women and in particular African-American women, women serving as mayors of major US cities, Atlanta, Chicago, New Orleans, uh, the District of Columbia, and of course, San Francisco. Uh, probably before that, one of my favorites, not necessarily a major city, but important to me in Rochester, New York. I'm a native of Buffalo, just down the road. Um, uh, these women are leading our cities through one of the most challenging times that our country has ever seen. Um, how do you think their experiences as women and as women of color are helping them to become successful leaders? Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, for those of us who, who come from communities of color, one of the things that we know to be true is that oftentimes uh, communities of color have had to not just exist, but to survive in some of the harshest of conditions. And I would say that that is especially true for uh, large parts of the, of the black community and for black women in particular. And so when I think about sort of what's going on right now in the context of the pandemic, um, for, for all of us, um, it is a time of incredible devastation and chaos and calamity. And for a subset of us, it is similar though different to um, our day-to-day -day lives and how we have to navigate and move and exist. And so it, it's not surprising to me that we have black women at the forefront who are helping to lead and guide uh, their, their communities through this time and they are doing so uh, brilliantly. Um, you know, when you think about just sort of communities of color, again, um, women of color, black women, we have had to lead in some of the, you know, most devastating conditions from slavery to, uh, you know, pandemics at, and, and everything in between. And so in many ways, we were made for a time such as this, because we have, we have, been existing for for large parts of our lives in in similar conditions and so i would say that those lived experiences as black women um, have given them the ability to understand and relate to other people um, who are having um, you know a very challenging time um, getting through the pandemic whether it be because of the economic impacts the mental health impacts um, um, and everything in between so i am um, so grateful uh, to have the leadership of uh, women with 
real lived experience like Mayor London Breed, like uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, like Mayor um, uh, Muriel Bowser in, in DC and so many others who are able to bring forth that lived experience to not just ensure that the black community is, is, is well resourced, but is looking out for the entire community. And that truly is, I believe, one of the hall hallmarks of, of black female leadership. That is, we wanna make sure that everyone does well. When we, when we, we wanna reach back and we wanna pull everyone up. And so, um, yeah. Yes, I, I would agree that it's no accident that um, voters, and especially when everybody has the right to vote, uh, have made these selections across major urban areas to put black women in uh, key leadership positions serving as mayors. Um, it, it's not just an accident of history. I think it speaks powerfully to our understanding as a society that uh, black women are uniquely positioned to be able to lead us through many of the challenges that we have right now. So thank you for your answer. I'd like to pivot uh, to city administrator Chu and um, ask you um, to speak, uh, what would you say to employees and especially to our women employees as we're thinking about what it means to return um, back to our offices and especially our women employees who are going to have unique challenges with childcare, uh, with educating children who have been uh, challenged greatly throughout this year. Uh, I'd like to get your additional thoughts about that, City Administrator Chu. Sure. Um, I definitely wanted to share some thoughts about that, but I also want to just just say too, you know, I think um, I think uh, Director Ellis gave a a very um, I think a nuance and deep um, dive into, into some of the leadership that we've seen across the country that I'm really grateful for because we've seen so many of our, of our women leader, in particular our black women leaders, really rise and show just what, what leadership means in, in a very difficult situation. And I, I also want to say that it, it also means that, you know, I, I, I take a look at it from also the perspective of being an Asian woman. I think we bring our identity, our, our whole identity to the table whenever we're serving, right? And whenever we're in these positions, I'm a mother, I'm an Asian American woman, I'm someone who comes from an immigrant family, among many, many other identity and pieces that, that are part of me. And, and I have to say, one of the challenges that I face as an Asian American woman leader is that I also face many stereotypes about Asian women being demure, being not aggressive, not being leadership, but being good in supportive roles. So I wanna make sure that we address those issues because it would be truly a disservice if we didn't do that, right? And I think we all bring very unique um, uh, experiences to the table that are our strengths. The struggles that the immigrant communities have had also speak to perseverance and persistence and the ability to, to rise, right? And so I just wanna make sure that I, I, I put that out there. Um, I think being a young mother, so I, I gave birth to my very first child in 2019. Um, it was a very, very hard um, uh, time trying to get pregnant, especially being an older mother. And I think many women probably face those kinds of struggles between choosing, create, starting a family, their careers and other things. Um, we we're very, very, very lucky that we were able to welcome Kaylee into our life. But I will say being a mother is so hard. Mm. It is so hard. And there is no perfect mother. I mean, I just... I used to be that person who said, I will never give my kid a device. And now I'm saying, holy moly, <laughs> if I could just get a minute of peace, I'll take it, right? So I think just when I think about as, as we're dealing, I think for, for many, many women being um, primary caretakers for their elderly parents, for young children, and then having to also be in a position of working in order to make sure that they have the resources to support the family, that's sort of the situation that we're in right now. And I think I, I have to say that the pandemic has been unkind to women. <laughs> it's, you know, from the perspective of health, about, you know, the impact on the economy, um, women not having the same economic security, savings, all of that, that to help people weather the storm, and then also the additional burdens of family care and so on, it's not been kind. And I, I think when I think about how do we help women who are coming back to the workforce, because this is, this is truly something that we're going to be contending with, I think it is really 
to put out there what the challenges are to speak honestly and open about some of the issues. Being an elected, I, I know also that sometimes the systems aren't set up to support women being in these roles. Uh, to give you just a quick example, you know, there are political events happen oftentimes in the evening hours and on weekends, right? Exactly the time when I have to be putting my child to sleep. And not only that, for all the folks who say, just get on public transportation to get into meetings, really, I can't jump into a taxi cab with my child to go to these meetings, right? You've got to find parking, which also creates a whole other level of barrier to how it is that we participate. So I, I guess I would just say that for, for young mothers and for not young mothers, help us understand the barriers to how it is that you could be most successful in your job. I hope in my role, I'll be able to create and strike that right balance because, you know, at the end of the day, the thing that is most important to me is my family. And I love my job. I love it. I, I'm passionate about the work that I do, but my most important piece is my family. And I need to also make sure my life reflects that. The time that I spend with my family reflects that. And I think the more we put that out in the front to say that that is okay, that is a good choice to be making, the more that we make that the norm in, in how we operate. And so I guess I would just say, if you're a mother, you're struggling, or you're, you know, you've got all of these challenges, don't hide it. Don't try to put it behind the scenes as if it wasn't happening, because it is. And we need to acknowledge it as a, as a city and as a government. Um, I think you might be on mute, Carol. I am. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that inspiring answer. I too want to make sure as we start thinking about uh, coming back to the offices that we're paying close attention to the needs of our employees and especially our women employees who have had to have made so many changes in their lives over this past year to continue to be productive and to provide uh, for themselves and for their families. Um, I would like to pivot now to Dr. Phillip and to ask specifically about her experience in fighting against uh, COVID and what has been your experience as a woman and a woman of color um, in, the, in the executive leadership team as we have as a city and as a country engaged in this uh, fight against uh, this pernicious disease. Well, it has been, I, I know I'm not the only one. It has been quite a year for, for everyone on this panel um, and for everyone who is, who's, who's listening. And, and I, so I know that um, uh, my, my situation is not, is not unique, but I have been um, activated as part of the city's response ever since our department operations center activated. And that was back in January 21st um, of last year. So it has been uh, quite a quite a long while in, in doing this work. And I think that um, always have felt supported. I have always felt supported by uh, departmental leadership and, and city leadership in, in doing this role. It is, it is challenging. I've been a deputy health officer for quite some time and had an opportunity to learn from uh, Dr. Aragon when he was the, the health officer here and have had support from people in, in my role across the, the region, the Bay Area health officers in the state. So that's been very helpful. I also think that um, as much work as it's been in those early days, you know, we, we didn't know, we didn't know anything. We didn't know how we were gonna get testing done. We didn't know how we were going to protect the hospitals and the uh, people who were working and residing in our skilled nursing facilities. There was, there was so much uncertainty and yet it was, uh, I think I've heard many people say this and I will say it too, was one of the most, maybe the most rewarding time in my career because it was very, very clear that the hours that we were putting in and all of the efforts and all of the trying to figure it out meant something, meant a lot. And I think that's one of the joys of, of public service and, and public work is that it's not a question of, of what the bottom line is. It's, it's really the bottom line is in people's lives and improving them, and in this case, and saving them. And so, you know, I, I don't have any regrets. Um, I also have uh, young young children who are um, nine and, and six right now, and I haven't seen them very much for the past year. So that is a sacrifice. But I think, you know, we joke that we're a little bit like a NASA family. You know, it's sort of like I'm, I'm on Mars right now, and um, I'll be mm -hmm. back one day. But, but it's a, 
a shared a shared sense of that public service and spirit. I'll say the other thing is it's been such a gift to get to know and meet some of the other um, leaders, um, women leaders um, across the city. So I'm delighted to be on the panel um, right now. But but in in addition, just in sorting out how are we going to get a testing site up? How are we going to do this or that? There's been an opportunity to work with directors um, across the city in in doing some of this work, and that is. Uh, that's been really great to have their input and their advice and support and see their leadership. So I think trying to look for the silver linings in, in leadership development wherever we can and, and not let any crisis, including COVID, go to waste. Yes, and many women in those decision-making uh, chains and perhaps introverts, but clearly making decisive moves and timely moves uh, that has really protected us all. I've also noticed, uh, and I do have a couple more questions for the panelists before we end, but I've also, we've all seen it, the controversy around masking and vaccine and all the public health measures to protect ourselves and the way our citizens have reacted uh, here in California and seeing our health directors and our public health officers being under direct attack, uh, many of them resigning as a result. So. Um, in San Francisco, you've had a lot of staying power, and uh, we really appreciate all the work that you have done. Um, I'd like to ask uh, another question of Director Ellis. Uh, uh, Carmen Chu spoke about mentorship and how important that is. Um, have you had role models and mentors? And uh, what are some of the steps that you might suggest to us that we can help build those relationships? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, no one does this work alone. And I think that one of the best things that women uh, can do is to sort of embrace an ethos of um, always being sure that we have a mentor and uh, always being sure that uh, we are mentoring uh, someone else. And so there is this sort of, um, as we climb, we lift uh, philosophy uh, in, 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 in the women's uh, leadership space. And I think that that will, um, that kind of an alignment will, will serve us well. Um, certainly the, the women who, who I consider to be mentors are uh, women who, uh, who I respect and admire uh, who have dedicated their their lives and their livelihood to helping others, and um, you know, I I truly try to um, you know sort of surround myself with women who are a couple levels at least above where I am. Right? I, I my, my my philosophy is if you're the smartest person in the room, you're probably in the wrong room, right? So I want to always uh, be surrounded, especially with respect to women and women leaders, um, with women who have lived a very um, fruitful life and have a lot to teach and to share uh, with those who, who are coming up behind them. So mentors and mentees play an important role as we talk about the pipeline of, of, of women's leadership uh, and development. Well, thank you for that thought. As we climb, we lift. I like that a lot. So I have uh, one final question for all the panelists. Uh, do you feel that you are able to bring your whole self to work? And uh, how has this changed over time and how can we improve on that uh, as our goal for all of our women employees to be able to bring their whole selves to work? Uh, let's uh, start with you, uh, City Administrator Chu. Um, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I have to say that um, it, that's been an evolving, something that has been evolving. So I think as I have um, grown in my capacity, my roles, my confidence in the work that I do, my reputation, I feel like I could bring more of my whole self to, to the job. I think initially there's always this feeling that you have to be a certain way. You have to be the, the leader, the characteristic of a leader that people expect, right? You've got to be forceful. You've got to be aggressive. You've got, you know, so all these different things that people kind of say should be a, a, the characteristics of a leader. When you first start off, I think there's a tendency to kind of try to mimic that, right? But then I think over time, as you start to develop your own, your own style, your own um, kind of way, 
you become more comfortable in your own skin and saying, it's okay for me to be the silly, bad joke person that I am, because I am, I love puns and those kinds of things. But I think rarely do people see all of you, right? Because you kind of feel like you have to have a pressure to be a certain way. And so I think really the question is, do you feel you can bring your whole self to the table? Probably not the entire self at this moment, but I think that as you grow in your roles and profession, you do more of that. So I hope that, especially, I think, especially in these times when we're talking about so much challenges in the AAPI community with um, racism and hate and other things, I really do hope that I can elevate that voice to share um, more authenticity about how that affects me as a leader, as just a regular citizen in the city. Um, and I think it takes it takes a lot to kind of share your emotional vulnerability as leaders. And I, I hope to be able to do more of that because I can't imagine a more important time that that needs to happen. Well, thank you for that thoughtful answer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Philip, uh, how would you respond to this question about bringing your whole self to work? I think similar themes to, to what we just heard from city administrator Chu. I, um, I think that it is also a matter of being able to feel comfortable with as much or as little of yourself that you want to bring. And it's okay for people to also have parts of themselves that they, they hold back and not give everything to work because that's also another um, extreme that um, I've, I've sometimes said, oh, maybe I should, I should do that. But um, finding a balance, I think it is a practice. So that idea of getting better at it um, that she mentioned really resonated. And so I'm, I'm still in that process. But what I also wanna be able to do is create an atmosphere for the people around me that they can also share as much as they want, that no one feels that they are hampered from bringing parts of themselves that they want to bring to, to their work, because I think we're all uh, better off for it and our, our work is better off for it. So I think that's a great question and it's something I'm going to continue to work on. Thank you, Dr. Philip and Director Ellis. We, uh, how would you respond to that question about bringing your whole self to work? Yeah, I would say that uh, gratefully, uh, I I am finally in a place where I do believe that I can bring my whole self. What I will say is that uh, to the points that have been made. Uh, by the other two panelists, it has been a process, and it also has been uh, it has not been without pros and cons, uh, because there's always someone who's going to believe that uh, parts of your whole self um, is just a little too much uh, for 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 them and whatever their concept of of how you should be um, is. And I'll never forget um, one of the best pieces of advice that I got. It happened to be during the time that I was running to be the chair of the California Democratic Party. And we had a, um, a tagline in the campaign that we were gonna be the campaign that had the courage to facilitate difficult conversations and tell hard truths. And really that was about sort of us bringing our whole selves in that context um, as the Democratic Party. But um, one of my very best friends said when we were sort of getting a lot of heat about our approach of, of, of wanting to be transparent and open and honest. Um, you know, there was, there was, uh, and I, I was, I was laughing, uh, giggling at what um, city administrator Chu was saying about, you know, leadership has this idea of, we must be authoritative. We must be assertive. We must be aggressive. In my, in my case, those things um, will get you sort of uh, cast with the angry black woman um, uh, tag, right? And so I'll never forget one of my best friends when I was trying to sort of figure out how do I navigate this and thread this needle so that I, I, I appear as, you know, um, assertive, but not too aggressive. And he said to me, he said, Kimmy, no matter what you do, no matter how articulate you are, no matter how presentable you look, there's always going to be a subset of people who think of you as an angry black woman. And so instead of running from that, run towards that, right? If that is authentic, you know, whatever, whatever it is, run towards that, not away from it and embrace it. And so for me, um, showing up as my authentic whole self means many things, but at its core for me, it means that I'm not, I actually believe what I'm preaching. And so 
for some people, they're going to love it. For others, not so much. Um, but really, I'm I'm not in this. I'm not in the in in the business of public service to make friends. I'm in this to make change and and for the people. And that, at its core, is what public service is all about. And so, if you lead in that way, um, then you 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 don't get caught up spending so much time worrying about what other people think about you. Uh, well, I think we're going to end on that answer, uh, and an excellent one it was. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists for sharing your time and your wisdom with us this afternoon. You've given us a lot to think about. And to all of our hardworking employees, thank you. Look for our email with a recording of this video, and thank you for turning in, uh, for, for uh, tuning in. And we will see you next time. Again, thank you very much to all of our distinguished panelists. Thank you.